Good morning. Matthew chapter 8, as Susan just encouraged us, you can turn there. Uh, Just a couple things to cover before we jump into God's Word this morning, but uh, how great is it to have more baptisms today, huh? That is... What, a, what an amazing celebration we get to do when, when people place their faith in Christ and choose to identify publicly with him. We get to be part of that. It's a church family. And uh, I think it's one of the greatest things we get to be able to do. So please, uh, after the service, our uh, folks that got baptized will be out in the foyer over here. And there is cake. Uh, so everybody likes cake. But go introduce yourself. Um, congratulate them. Let them know that you'll be praying for them. Um, it's a great day. We get to celebrate those together. I want to thank Pastor Mike for uh, preaching for us last week, taking us into God's Word, uh, finishing out chapter 7 and kind of getting us into the beginning of chapter 8 and establishing really where we're going to be for the next uh, three, four weeks. And that is understanding how God has established Jesus' authority while he was here on earth. What are the things that we are able to see and know and hear uh, that are recorded for us that show us that not only was Jesus a uh, a wonderful uh, layer of God's word, not only was he uh, a good uh, man as he walked on this earth, but he was more than that. He is God. And his authority being established really shapes everything else. And one of the things I love how Matthew does this is as he establishes Jesus' authority, he gives us multiple examples that kind of back that up, some evidences for us. But more importantly than that, as he gives us those evidences, he then instructs us, he reminds us how it is that we should live in light of knowing what we know. And that's really what we need to be taking away as we're walking our way through these passages in Scripture. We've been introduced in in Matthew 1 through 4 to the person of the king. That was the first section we spent in this Kingdom of God series in Matthew. We talked about the person of the king in Matthew 1 through 4. And then in Matthew 5 through 7, we talked about the principles of the kingdom, right? This, the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus says, okay, now you, you seem to have kind of been intrigued by what, I, what I've been saying and who, who I am and what I've been doing. Now I want to talk to you about what it means to actually follow me. And that Sermon on the Mount uh, all the way through 5 through 7 kind of walks us through the principles of the kingdom of God. So the person of the king, the principles of the kingdom, and now this next section is about the power of the king. And we start to see that that Jesus' ministry here, that he's working with the people around him and and revealing himself to, to communities and larger groups of people, as he does that, he's establishing himself in power. And as we look at these next few chapters, one of the things that that we really need to be able to take away and walk away with is How do we understand, as followers of Christ, how do we understand the power of God? And the power of God that exemplifies itself through Jesus in these sections, how does that truth change us? As we talk about the power of God and how God relays this, we see some miracles happening. And these miracles that Jesus is performing here and walking people through are so important in the nature of what we understand to be who God is and how he works. So as we look at this, there's a reason that these miracles actually happen. So these, there's really three main reasons why these miracles happen, and I'm going to walk us through why they happen. Because I think in today's day and age, one of the difficult things is we expect miracles in certain situations— And we're not always sure why God does or doesn't provide them in the moment that we expect. So, in that that being said, as we look at why these are happening, there's three reasons why God gives us these particular miracles in this particular place. And as I say them, I'm looking at them, and as I say them, I'm understanding that they are in need right now. The first is this. Jesus performs miracles for compassion. Because of compassion, because of the fact that God actually understands our human needs and knows what's going on with us, he performs miracles so that we know that he can take care of us. It's compassion. We have a compassionate God. He is not a removed God. He's not a God that's separate from us. He's not a God that's in a different place and doesn't care about what goes on with us. But he cares very distinctly what's going on with our our human bodies. And he cares very distinctly what's going on right now. He is a compassionate God. 
So we get confused sometimes about why miracles happen, but the biggest reason that God wants us to understand that he can provide miracles is because his compassion guides how he lives and how he acts. His compassion for us. God's concerned about our temporal well-being because we are his creations. It's wrong to separate the ministry of the body from the ministry of the soul. And this is somewhat of a false teaching that's happened over time in Christianity and the world. That what goes on with the body is separate from what goes on with the soul. And Jesus shows us right here as he enters into these physical miracles that that's not the case. What goes on with your body is connected to what goes on with your soul and vice versa. And he cares about both. So the first reason that Jesus performs miracles is because he is a compassionate God. The second reason, not only compassion, but credentials. God wants people to know who Jesus is. And he shows them who Jesus is by what Jesus is able to do in his power. So not only is compassion a motivating factor, but credentials that we would understand who Jesus is and not get confused that he's not just another good speaker. He's not just a prophet or another good priest. He is more than that. He is God in flesh. And those credentials change how we see him. And then thirdly, compassion and credentials, and thirdly, is concern. Jesus' concern primarily is that others would understand and know the truth of God's love and redemption. He's concerned with the fact that we understand his truth and that we convey his truth to others. These miracles were literally, they're, they're sermons in action. So if you recall, back in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is walking his way through how it is that God's people should live and act and interact with not only each other, but with the world around us. And in doing so, when he goes and performs these miracles, he's showing us part of what it looks like to act the way that he's called us to act. Jesus has concern that the world knows the truth of God's love and forgiveness. And these miracles happen, they are present in this time, what we're looking at in Matthew 8, because God wants all to know that he has sent his son and has put on flesh and that his, not only his compassion and his credentials are important, but his concern for the souls of all those who did not yet know him. In John chapter 3, 1 and 2, it tells us that even Nicodemus, who was a Pharisee, a religious leader of the day, even Nicodemus was impressed because of his compassion and credentials. But Jesus' concern for Nicodemus is what made a real difference. And as we walk through these miracles, here's what I want us to be protected against today. There are three different sets of miracles that go on through this particular section. These first five, we're going to look at, um, last week, Pastor Mike talked about the first one. We're going to look at two more today. These first five in this section happen in one particular place in Capernaum. Capernaum is a, a city, a town in northern Israel. Uh, Peter is from there, and we see in a minute where this connects to Peter's personal life um, as well in, in Capernaum. And these five miracles happening in that particular place are very important. Why? Because later, as we look in Matthew 11, Capernaum rejected Jesus. We see five of these amazing miracles happen in one town, and it's not a very big town. I've actually been there. It's, it's not a huge place. There's, it wasn't a place with a ton of people in it, and word spread quickly about what we're going to read in just a moment here. But even though five of these first distinct miracles that Matthew shows us happen in Capernaum, Capernaum rejected Jesus. They didn't believe. What does that tell us about miracles and themselves and miracles alone? We have to be careful of this as God's people, right? We have to be careful of thinking if God did something more spectacular, it'd be easy to believe him. It's not true. 
We see it here as an example. We see it many other times where Jesus performs great miraculous things with the power of God flowing through him and people are healed and things are changed and and people are restored and there are still many who are watching with their own eyes as those things happen that choose to reject him. So miracles alone do not completely change the situation. There's one Simple act, not simple, there is one very important act that we see in human history and in scripture that changes everything, and it's not the leper being healed or the paralyzed woman being healed or the mother-in-law of Peter. Those are not the things that change everything in the course of human history. There's one thing that does. Jesus's death and resurrection on your behalf and mine. That, that truth is greater than anything we read today in this section. The truth of what he has done through defeating sin and rising from the grave is the single greatest truth. And one of the reasons we see, as we'll talk a little bit about in a minute here, that Jesus tells people don't go spreading the word too greatly and getting everybody excited because of what you see today in this, in this particular context in Matthew 8 is because he doesn't want a lot of fake followers because of some miraculous thing he did. He wants people who knows who he is and believe in what he has done. So the biggest thing that we see here is there is a greater truth that is established for us by these miracles, but these miracles are not the greater truth. The greater truth is what Jesus has done for us. The cross and the resurrection, as we witness today in the the following of baptism and in the stories of life change that we heard, the cross and the resurrection are the single greatest act the single greatest, single greatest sacrifice, the single, single greatest miracle. These are just kind of ancillary things that Jesus is doing so that people would understand he's not just another guy walking around talking. But he is the Messiah. So it's worth noting that Capernaum later completely rejects Jesus even though these miracles happen there. One thing is certain, Jesus did not perform miracles to get a crowd. He did not. In fact, he avoided the crowds, even while he was performing miracles. And this is something we've talked a little bit about false teaching, even as we've been walking our way through the book of Matthew, but this is something we need to take very seriously as the people of God. Great miraculous works that God does are not done through, him, through us or through the church so that we can gain a huge crowd. That's not what Jesus does. He performs them so that people will know that they can trust him and follow him and that he changes lives. Salvation is always the end result of how God is working. Not popularity, not just sheer emotion or excitement, not so that word will spread, Those are not the end result that God is looking for. The end result that God is looking for is sinners repenting and being made new in him. That's always the end result Jesus is working towards. So he did not want people trusting him simply on the basis of spectacular deeds. John 4 tells us that. Romans 10 tells us that faith must be on him, on Jesus, and his word. What he has taught what he has said. His word is what we choose to place our faith in. So the miracles in these groups are, in these uh, chapters are grouped into three, three different groups. But each group, the first group we're going to look at today, ends with a discipleship moment. The second group ends with a discipleship moment. And the third group of miracles ends with a discipleship moment. So every time these great miraculous things happen, Jesus pauses and says, here's what you need to remember from this. And gives us a moment to do that. So let's read. I'm going to read verse 5 down through 22. You are more than welcome to follow along with me as we go through this particular section. Matthew chapter 5, or chapter 8, verse 5. Chapter 8, verse 5. 
See, when he entered Capernaum, a centurion came forward, appealing to him. Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, suffering terribly. And he said to him, I will come and heal him. But the centurion replied, Lord, I am not worthy to have you under my roof, but only to say the word and my servant will be healed. For I too am a man under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes. And to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who followed him, truly I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. I tell you, many will come from east and west and recline at table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, while the sons of the kingdom will be thrown out into utter darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And the centurion And to the centurion, Jesus said, go, let it be done for you as you have believed. And the servant was healed that very moment. When Jesus entered Peter's house, he saw his mother-in-law lying sick with a fever and he touched her and the fever left her. She rose and began to serve him. That evening, they brought to him many who were oppressed with demons and he cast out the spirits with a word And healed all who were sick. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. He took our illnesses and he bore our diseases. Now when Jesus saw a great crowd around him, he gave orders to go over to the other side. And a scribe came and said to him, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Another of the disciples said to him, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, follow me and leave the dead to bury their own dead. Those last few verses, verse 18 through 22, are are the discipleship moment that follows up these verifying miracles that Jesus performs. So I want to walk our way through what's happening in this section. This first set, these first three miracles, the the lepers that Pastor Mike walked us through last week, that miracle, uh, here the centurion's servant and Peter's mother. These first three miracles are all miracles that happen to outcasts of society. And Jesus has a principle here he's trying to help us understand. In that day and and age, lepers, Gentiles, and women were considered outcasts by many of the Jewish population. Lepers, Gentiles, and women. Especially regarded that way by the Pharisees. Many of the Pharisees would actually pray every morning when they got up. I give thanks that I am a man and not a woman. A Jew and not a Gentile. A free man and not a slave. See, that's what was going on in the religious culture of the day. There were outcasts that were, were deemed not worthy of people's attention or of God's grace. And these three, the lepers, the Gentiles, the, the centurion and his servants, and Peter's mother, in many religious circles were not even given the time of day and were not seen as being worthy of it. And Jesus starts off here, Matthew records for us, by going distinctly and directly to the outcasts of that current day society and saying, not only do I care for them, but I'm going to heal them because they are loved by my Father. So when we read sections like this, I think sometimes it's easy to get caught up in the the emotional action of what's going on here, right? Lepers getting healed, a paralyzed servant getting healed without Jesus even being present, And then Peter's mother-in-law being healed, getting out of bed, and going and serving him and all his disciples. Those are the the emotional actions that catch us up. But, But what's most important here is to understand these distinct people that Jesus is going to and healing in this moment is showing us something and telling us something. It is not disconnected from the Sermon on the Mount and the Beatitudes that we just read. The least of these is who Jesus came to save. Those who knew they needed a doctor and a healer is who Jesus goes to. And the Pharisees would have declared condemnation on him 
for going anywhere near a leper or even talking to the centurion. He's a Gentile. Don't talk to him. Or going and causing a miracle to happen for a woman, which in that day and age, and, and even in the Jewish population, were seen as second-rate citizens. Jesus is showing us something here, and it's that every person carries value. Every person. In God's eyes, there are no outcasts. There are only sinners in need of grace. The centurion servant here being healed has a powerful story. Centurions oversee a, a roughly 100 men. So this man was powerful. He was a Roman centurion. He had swing. He had weight. He, he had people under him, and they were soldiers under him. So he could have come to Jesus with a lot of pride and arrogance here. He could have demanded Jesus do something. But that's not how he approaches Jesus. He approaches Jesus humbly and with a distinct amount of faith that Jesus, and this is interesting because there's only a couple places in Scripture, twice in the Gospels, where it's recorded that Jesus marvels. Okay? Think about that. Jesus is blown away by what the centurion says because he hasn't seen this kind of faith in anybody else yet. Jesus is blown away by it. Twice in the Gospels, it's recorded that Jesus marveled. Here, at the great faith of the Gentile centurion, and in Mark 6, he marvels at the unbelief of the Jews. <laughs> okay. We want to be on one side of that marveling and not on the other side. Okay? This, this text, that I've, and I, I've actually heard this taught on a number of different occasions, but sometimes I hear this text taught, and, we, and it's all about the faith of the centurion. Now, the faith of the centurion is great. It's significant. It's actually a challenge. It's a challenge to me. It should be a challenge to you. How much does the centurion believe this? But the faith of the centurion is not the point of this text. The power of Jesus is the point of the text. The faith of the centurion is only in the power of Jesus. And Jesus demonstrates that power by healing his servant without even needing to go. The centurion was just asking. Jesus says, I'll go with you. I'll go with you and I will heal your servant. The centurion says, I'm not worthy for you to come in my house. Please don't do that. You don't need to go anywhere. You say the word and it'll be done. The centurion understood this, right? The centurion understood chain of command, right? So if he told the soldier to do something, the soldier was going to do it. It says, if I, tell, if I tell one of my guys to go, he's going to go. If I tell them to come, they're going to come. If I tell a servant to go and do something, they're going to go and do it. He says, I understand chain of command, and I understand that you have authority. So you say the word, and it'll be done. I believe that. So the faith of the centurion is significant for us. Do we believe Jesus for those types of things in that type of way? Do we believe that Jesus can do at any moment in time exactly what he wills? Do we believe that? It should be for the people of God. But that's still not the objective of this text. The objective is that we see the power of Jesus and we are marveled at by it. That his authority takes root in our lives. Not just the life of the centurion, not just the life of, of Peter's mother, not just the life of the lepers in the earlier text last week, but that his authority takes root in our lives. And that's what he wraps up with here at the end. This discipleship moment, after healing the centurion's servant, and after healing Peter's mother, and then earlier after healing the lepers, this discipleship moment in verses 18 through 22 is where we're going to spend just a couple minutes here before we close. This moment, Jesus is talking to those who just watched all these things happen. And by the way, it's not just Peter's mother. Word spread. Peter's mother got healed. She got up. She serves them dinner. She takes care of them all. And a line starts outside the door of her house. Word spread and people are like, I need some of that. I'm going to go. I want to be healed. And Jesus heals many, it says. He casts demons out of those who were oppressed. He heals their sicknesses. 
It says to establish from Isaiah 53 verse 4 that he took our illnesses and bore our diseases. And then Jesus takes a few moments with those that are following because here what you see in verse 18. It says a great crowd surrounded him. And what does Jesus do? Does he play to the crowd? Does he tell them to go tell everybody else so the crowd gets bigger? No, he actually removes himself. Capernaum is right on the edge of the Sea of Galilee. And after this happens, it's a coastal town on the sea there. And after this happens, he says to his disciples, all these people start to gain, gain traction around him and get excited. And he says, let's go to the other side. Hop in the boats, guys. We're, we're pulling away here, okay? And he, he seeks to leave the crowd. And he has these two interactions that are very interesting. One, a scribe in verse 19 comes to him and says, teacher, I'll follow you wherever you go. And Jesus tests the statement that he just made. He says, you follow me wherever, huh? He says, foxes have holes and birds have air. Birds of the air have nests. But the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. You want to sign up for that? Jesus is saying, to follow me is difficult. Don't loosely throw around the words, I'll follow you anywhere, Jesus. Understand the cost at which that comes with. We've talked about this in a couple of weeks ago. The narrow gate that is difficult to go through is what Jesus calls us to. Jesus looks at the guy and he says, all right, I hear what you're saying. I want to make sure you understand what that means. You saying I'll follow you wherever you go means I have no place to go. I'm going everywhere. I'm traveling around. I won't have a home. You won't have a home if you choose to do this. Are you ready for that? Is that what you really mean? I'll follow you? Then there's a second individual. Another of the disciples said to him, Lord, let me go first and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, follow me and leave the dead to bury their own dead. Okay, this is a tough one. Because you read that and you're like, wait a minute, what? That sounds slightly insensitive. Okay, but here's the background for this particular statement that Jesus is making. This disciple is saying to Jesus, I will follow you, but I need to go back and take care of some things. His father wasn't dead, okay? What he was saying is, I'm gonna go home and wait for my parents to die. I'm gonna wait for my dad to die, and then once they die, then I'll take care of all that, and I'll bury them. I have no idea how long that'll be. That could be days, weeks, months, years. Then when I've taken care of what I think I need to take care of, then I'll follow you. So we have to put this in, in English. This sounds very harsh. Okay? Follow me and let the dead bury their dead. That Jesus is, we've already explained his compassion, right? He's not being, he doesn't exhibit a lack of compassion in this statement. He's actually saying to this guy, in a spiritual sense, you need to follow me now. The earthly things are going to work themselves out. They're going to take care of them. He's not saying don't take care of your father. He's saying follow me now and don't let those other things get in the way. As he says this to both of these men, the one who says I'll follow you in here and the one who says let me go back and take care of my family things first. He challenges them both. Did you just see and hear what I just did? these miraculous works, does it not demonstrate the authority of Jesus in this world and in people's lives and over all creation? It does. It demonstrates his authority. And the discipleship moment here, coming out of these three miracles, this first set, is not go home marveling at the miracles. The discipleship moment is choose to follow Jesus. That's the objective here. There's a reason why the end of this particular passage and what Matthew is recording from this first three miracles in that one event, there's a reason why the end of it is not right at the end of the miracles and they can move on to something else. This moment was significant. And you can place yourself there, whether you're a disciple or somebody who just showed up to get healed or, or set free from a demon possession. Whoever it was that shows up, you can put yourself in that moment and think, this 
This man has power and authority more than anybody else we've ever seen. He speaks the word and the centurion's servant is healed. He didn't even have to go. This man has what no one else has. The authority of God. He has come as the Messiah. And Matthew, by, by the inspiration of God, uniquely wraps that together with us by saying, don't half-heartedly follow Jesus for the impressive stuff. That's not the goal. And I can say that, that over the course of history, over the course of church history, and over the course of people following Jesus, a lot of people follow Jesus for the flashy stuff. I'm going to follow Jesus, see if, see if he can fix everything in my life. Follow Jesus, see if he takes care of my financial woes. See if he takes care of my physical woes. See if he can give me what I want relationally in this world. See if he helps me get that promotion I'm hoping for, or that bigger house, or whatever it is. You can fill in the blank. The problem that we see here that Jesus is identifying with these two fellows at the end, don't follow Jesus for anything other than what Jesus has called you to follow him for. He's called you to follow him, to die to yourself and all those other things that you want, to set those aside and to choose to follow him in whatever he has for you, anything. I'm guessing, I'm not guaranteeing because I don't know the future and I don't know everyone's personal situation, but I'm pretty sure it won't look like what you think. And that's okay. Not only is it okay, it's God's will for your life to completely surrender under his authority to trust him without any hedging of bets and be fully in. Whatever you ask of me, I'm in. If Jesus looks at you and says, foxes have no holes, or have their holes, and birds of the air have their nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to do that? If Jesus says, set aside some of that earthly concern that you wanted so badly to take care of, and stop with the checklist of, I'll follow Jesus later. As soon as I get a couple other things done, Right? I hear this from all stages of life. Sometimes young people say, hey, I just need to get a little bit older. I gotta, I gotta live a little bit. I gotta experience a few things. I wanna, I, and then I'll, I'll get serious about Jesus later. You have no idea how many days you have. You might not have tomorrow. It doesn't matter which stage of life you're in. God is calling you to be all in with him. So this discipleship moment, the the moment that kind of shocks us at the end of these huge miracles that happen, these couple statements Jesus makes, he makes them in the context of people who were not ready to fully follow him. And he challenges them. Challenges them with a very direct couple statements. Follow me. You probably won't have everything you wished you had. But follow me anyway. Follow me. Stop worrying about the earthly concerns that you think you have to do before you fully commit. Just let those go and follow me. This call happens as we continue on in this chapter as Jesus continues with other miracles that these first three were to the outcasts of society. But, but Jesus continues and does miracles in other situations and in other environments that we're going to keep reading about. And it always comes back to the same thing. Are we willing to follow him with no hesitation, requirements, or other things we want to take along with us? Because the call to follow Jesus is the narrow road and the narrow gate. You'll have to sacrifice some things. Now, we're also not painting this picture that following Jesus is just so much work and labor. It's the greatest joy of your life. Because all that other stuff doesn't give you the same kind of joy. You think it does, you pursue it, and then you get it. And you're like, yeah, that's empty. 
you will never experience that with Jesus. The more you pursue, the more full you know he is. The more you pursue, the more substantial and eternal you know the joy to be. See, all the other stuff leaves you wanting. Jesus leaves you full. That's the story that we see in these first three miracles. And as we close and as we pray today, I'm going to ask that that you leave today hearing what God has to challenge you with. Maybe there's something in your life you're still holding on to. Maybe there's a particular way you're still holding out on him. He wants you all in. And just imagine what he can do with a room full of people who are all in on following him. We heard stories of change in baptism today. And those things, those, those, those different backgrounds that God redeems into one family is why we follow him in the ways that he's called us to. He does heal. He does miraculously do things. But all those things point to one thing. His saving grace. He has the only one, he is the only one with the power and authority to take away your sin and to give you new life. He's the only one. Won't you believe him for it and follow him today? I hope you will. Let's pray and ask him to help us do that.